I remember back many, many years reading a very strange book called uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And it was about a man who traveled across the United States in search of quality. And he had his young son on the back of his motorcycle. And it fascinated me because I rode a 750 motorcycle myself. And I wasn't in search of quality, but I was in search of God. I was kind of thinking to myself, what if there is a God and I've never given him the time of day? And when I die, you know, and stand before, before him, he's, he's, he's there. There's a reality. There is an afterlife. And I thought, I better check it out. So I got on my motorcycle and I traveled off to the East Coast. And I would get on my motorcycle and go to the, the ocean and, and just kind of pray and read many different books and was offered different books on spiritual journey. And at the end of that six months, I felt, well, God, I've given you a chance. You know, I was saying prayers, I was seeking for you, but you don't seem to want to show yourself. So if you're out there, you're really not able to be discovered. And kind of got back on my motorcycle, well, kind of, got back on my motorcycle and uh, came back to southern Ontario. And he sent uh, some teenage uh, teenagers to work for me who uh, were from the University of Waterloo and uh, just started sharing the love of Jesus with me. And it was a different approach because most people, if they looked at my life, was, oh, you're going to hell, you know, or you're living in sin because I was living with a man at the time. And, and that certainly never drew me to, to God, not at all. But I remember this one time with Karen when she told me how much God loved me. And I turned on her. I was so angry, not at Karen, but I was so angry at this God that people believe in and seem to have joy about, who I didn't know, I didn't understand, and I never felt his love for me, not at all. And so I'm just shouting at Karen right in the workplace. And it's like everybody else took a beeline and got into the dining room. I was uh, the manager of this fast food restaurant. And Karen just stood there as I'm just shouting at her, where's God when this happened and that happened and, and uh, the problems in my family and I was just, just rhyming off this huge list and all this. I mean, once you just open up that dam with all the hurt and anger and frustration, I, 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 it just didn't stop until it was done. And at the very end of it, Karen gave a response that had to be so inspired of God because I never forgot it. She looked me straight in the eye and she said, you know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed addresses. He's in the same place he was when they crucified his one and only son on the cross. And so here's Karen saying that Jesus is the son of God and that God was in the same place as when they crucified his son. Now, it didn't take away all the pain in my life. But it did take away, uh, it, it, well, it was a paradigm shift. It gave new meaning to the pain in my life. It uh, gave an understanding that, wow, God never intervened when his own son was nailed to the cross. He was silent. Even Jesus said, why hast thou forsaken me? The first time in his earthly life, he felt separated from his father. And I walked away. and It was something... It was one of those epiphanies, life-changing moment where all of a sudden you think on truth in a whole different way. You think on your pain in a whole different way. But I wasn't ready to come to the cross and, and get on my knees. But Karen got a lot of her friends at the University of Waterloo, a lot of other Christians, to start praying for me. They had what's called sort of a prayer hit list. And they continued to pray for my salvation. And God was setting the stage. But I was to be married that year in 1981 and just at City Hall, 11 o'clock in the morning, October 13th, and nobody knew, not my family, not my best friend. That's the way it happened in our family. It was kind of a rule. You get married, parents don't show up, so you just go elope. And so that was the plan. But two weeks prior to that uh, wedding at uh, City Hall, my fiancé got cold feet. Well, I don't know if it was cold feet, but he said, I don't want to get married on the 13th. Our anniversaries are going to be Friday the 13th. So we, I called up City Hall, changed the wedding date to December 22nd of the same year. And on the 13th, I uh, went off to work at 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm looking at the time, thinking to myself, hmm, I should be getting married right at this moment, and it's not happening. 
And Karen was no longer with me. She was back at university. I hadn't seen her since the end of August. And she called me up exactly at 11 o'clock that morning. And she said to me, Bev, I don't understand this, but do you have a prayer request? She said, I felt so strongly that I needed to call you and see if I could pray for you. Now I thought, oh, nobody knew I was to be married, least of all Karen. But if there's a God, God would know. Is he really trying to get my attention? Now, I didn't tell Karen what was going on. I just said nothing actually was happening in my life. It was rather boring. But deep down inside, I was flipping out. The hairs on the back of my neck were, were going straight up. And she wouldn't give in or give up, but she didn't get an answer from me. But she did ask. She said, you know what, Bev? I'd love to see you tomorrow, the next day, and just tell you how uh, university life is going. Can we just get together? And I, I, I said yes, for whatever reason. So I got off the phone, and, and what, Karen calls a bunch of people, and there they were. She was calling uh, all, uh, all the prayer line. They had sort of a prayer hotline. Um, I worked the rest of the day with God on my mind. No one knew I should have been married at 11 o'clock in the morning, but God was setting the stage. Karen now has got about 100 students from the University of Waterloo praying for my salvation, praying for an encounter, because I'm going to see Karen on the 14th, uh, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, when I finished my shift, and she was finished with some of her, uh, her lectures. But I went home that night, and my fiancé was already in bed. I guess some of those prayers knocked him out, and he's not uh, around to talk to. doesn't even remember that's the day that we, we would have been married. And I'm sitting alone in my living room and nothing on television, and I'm going to see Karen the next day. So I had every religious book you could imagine, including the Bible. Now, this wasn't the Bible I had, but I did take open a Bible, and, and I'm... Where do you start? You start in Genesis at the beginning of the Bible, and I'm flipping around. And I said, God, if you're real, I need to know tonight. I should have been married today, and it didn't happen. You have my attention. That's what I was saying to him. You have my attention. And the first scripture that I came across was John 3.16. We all know that one. If you go to any hockey games or football or baseball, somebody's got a t-shirt or a big banner hanging over the second level. Uh, John 3.16. Some even put the whole scripture out there. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I knew the scripture. It's probably one of the only ones I knew, but it just was shouting out at me. And I'm looking at that scripture going, oh yeah, God, right. That's people born in Christian families. Uh, but me, God, can you love me? I'm not a Christian. And then I, I flipped around and I was in Jeremiah 1.5. It says, before you were formed, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I had to know that. I wasn't a planned baby. I was before marriage baby. So I'm a mistake. I'm thinking, I'm an afterthought. I'm a postscript. I'm a PS. God, do you have plans for PS people? For afterthoughts? For ones that sort of born conceived in sin? God, can you love me? And that, that scripture really ministered to me, that God was saying, yeah, before you were formed, I knew you. I knew my life. I'd been sexually active. I'd, in, I, I'd been pregnant twice and had two abortions. I hated myself. I hated myself. I'd struggled through uh, all kinds of stuff. And uh, I was, God, I need one more scripture, one more scripture that you really love me, that you know everything about me, and that you actually still love me. And again, I'm just bouncing around in the scriptures. And I was in Matthew 10, 29. It says, uh, look at the sparrows. They're not worth, worth much, a few pennies. But not one sparrow falls to the ground without your father's knowledge. And then it says, do not fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. And something inside of me broke as I realized God, the creator of the universe, very God of very God, God of all gods, was speaking to my heart. 
was saying, I love you. I didn't have a vision. I didn't see Jesus walk through the door. But I tell you, I sense the most incredible weight of love embracing me right in sin. It wasn't, I, had, I was still living common law with this, young, this man. We weren't married yet. But God met me where I was. I didn't have to change one thing. It was just surrender. And I said, God, I'm yours. I don't know why you want me. I don't understand why you love me. But I understand that Jesus Christ lived the perfect life. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I broke. I, I cried for hours. And, and after the weeping, I, I, just a cleansing and a healing that went on.